In this episode, we discuss an investigation by the Indian Express that reveals how designated green zones in Goa are gradually being used for construction activities. We also talk about Rahul Gandhi's current trip to the US and his remarks about the BJP. But first, we talk about Manipur, where the ongoing violence has escalated since the beginning of this month. Hi, I'm Shashank Bhargav, and you're listening to Three Things, the Indian Express news show. Now, while the ethnic conflict between the Mete and the Kuki Zomi community in Manipur has now been going on for over 16 months, what alarmed security officials last week was the use of drones and improvised rockets as a new means of warfare. At least 11 people have been killed in the state since the 1st of September, with officials saying that while the attackers are still using crude bombs to inflict damage, the mode of delivery has changed. In light of this escalation, mobile internet, broadband and VPNs were banned yesterday for five days in the state. To discuss this recent flare-up and what officials are doing about it, Indian Express's Sukrita Barwa joins us. Sukrita, tell us where exactly did we see this recent violence take place? So, the incident that you're talking about of drones being used to drop bombs on villages took place in this area called Kothruk, which is located in Imphal West, which is a foothill area just um, close to Kangpokpi district. So, those who've been following this violence uh, for a long time are aware that some of the most volatile areas during the course of this conflict have been places where um, the Mete majority valley meets Kuki majority hill districts like Kangpokpi and Churichanpur. So this particular area is kind of at the border of the Imphal West district, which is a Mete majority district, and Kangpokpi, which is a Kukizomi majority district. So, you know, like you said, in this particular incident, you know, villagers reported bombs being dropped through drones on the villages. And in that, two people were killed of bullet injuries, and quite a few people were injured by the splinters from these bombs which were dropped. So that is the first, you know, different form of attack that was seen. And then a couple of days later, in another village, this is Moirang, which is in Bishnupur district, which is close to Churichanpur district. And this has been one of the like worst affected areas earlier as well. So has Kothrok, by the way, it's one of the worst affected areas in this conflict. So in this particular area, people, residents and security forces were talking about the use of rockets being fired at the village. So uh, speaking further to security officials, I found out that you know, what was being called rockets are basically projectiles. They're improvised rockets, say a galvanized iron pipe being attached with uh, explosives and, you know, basically is a flying projectile. And an elderly man was killed there as well because of this. Right. And this understandably has caused widespread panic. What have security officials said about this new means of warfare and this use of drones? So one of the top security officials told me that these uh, appear to be, of course, it's under investigation what kind of drones these are, where they've been procured from. But these appear to be the kind of drones that are used for delivery, so like delivering goods and so on. And this was the first time during the course of this conflict that drones were used to drop bombs, but they have been used by both sides. There have been a lot of images on social media of people on both sides, you know, flaunting their drones and all. And it has mostly been used for surveillance, reconnaissance, you know, taking videos and images of, you know, basically plan out things. But yeah, so this brought about a significant change. And after that, uh, you know, the security forces have mobilized and have been using anti-drone systems as well. And Sukrita, this escalation and violence has taken place after a period of relative calm, uh, the last time something like this happened was only back in April. So talk about the events that led up to this. Yeah, so one thing that's significant to note is that just the day before the violence in Kothruk uh, flared up, there was a large-scale rallies actually in different places by Kukizomi organizations across, you know, Churchanpur and Kangpokpi, you know, protests against the chief minister. You might be aware that, you know, there have been reports of audio clips purportedly of the chief minister, you know, talking about and uh, in the audio clips, he seems to be admitting his complicity. Of course, the veracity of these clips 
protests are yet to be confirmed but you know these have been doing the rounds so these protests were against that since the very next day we've been seeing this kind of flare up of violence so like i told you earlier i had spoken to security officials and like in terms of how they're going to address it and of course the response is limited to yeah we can deploy anti drone machinery and one of the top security officials he said you know this can always only be a limited exercise because like this spell of violence is coming after several months of a uh, relative calm we can't call it peace but relative calm especially along these fringe areas and he said that this is not the first time either there have been other such lull periods as well but it inevitably will flare up because there is no progress being made on the dialogue front right so people stay calm for a while and then they get frustrated at the lack of any positive development or any movement forward and then it culminates into this uh, as we saw you know before this outbreak of violence there was a widespread rally and you know what the uh, security official said that this is a way to get attention this escalation of violence so top security officials in the state are also talking about the need for the center to intervene to actively begin dialogue and you write that recently the chief minister had even appointed an emissary and he was supposed to initiate talks between mlas and societies on both sides can you tell us who he is and what he says about what is being done at the moment So Mr Dingalong Gangme he is a Naga MLA and from the BJP and he said that you know yes i have met with uh, both the Kukizomi MLAs Mete MLAs we met together but you know some things are just out of our control this conflict has much wider implications now and it can't be you know resolved at this level and i can just facilitate you know bringing everybody on the same table but i don't have the terms of reference to actually negotiate this and it is going to have to be the center which is going to have to intervene so there has been a mounting demand in manipur for the center's intervention now and this is what we're seeing on the political front as well you know uh, last week shortly after the first attack rk rajkumar emo singh who is a senior legislator from the bjp in the state and he's also biren singh's son in law which is pretty significant so he wrote a very strongly worded letter to the union home minister and said that you know i have to express like disappointment he didn't use those exact words but that's what he was conveying through his letter and he said that you know see it's been 16 months at this point we would expect that the violence is behind us and that we're engaging in dialogue but still we're seeing you know new forms of violence emerge at this point of time so one of the core demands and this is a demand which you know you see across the manipur valley is that the central forces should be removed because there is a huge deployment of say army the sam rifles central armed police forces like bsf crpf and they're saying that you know they're not being able to do anything and uh, rk emo call them i quote mute spectators so he demanded that these be removed and let the state police forces take over of course this is very contentious because the kuki zomi populations accuse the state police forces of being partisan in favor of the methes and in fact even when the sam rifles were shifted from a couple of places there was a huge outcry among the cookie zomi community right and even from the other side we saw protests take place for the unified command which was set up for the coordination of all the security agencies in the state and the people from the mete community were demanding that this unified command should be under the chief minister right now of course it's being headed by a retired ips officer but you know when we talk about an intervention by the center and this is something that both sides are talking about do we know what this intervention would even look like what do they want the central government to do two things the representatives of the kukizomi community have not been willing to sit for talks because one of the prerequisites that they have been demanding is the removal of nbdensing the kukizomi mlas and csos have been refusing to engage there had been a peace committee that was formed actually last year but neither side wanted to engage in it nbdensing was a part of it so that has been one thing that has been in the way and the other is of course like like mr gangme said how can he negotiate on the question of separate administration there has to be something that the center has to take charge of now which way it goes we don't know but that is something that only the center can negotiate so if dialogue has to happen right you can't ignore this demand and this question and how it has to be negotiated the ball is completely in the center's court And next we talk about Goa. An Indian Express investigation has revealed how politicians across party lines, 
including two state ministers and multiple real estate companies in Goa, have been able to do construction activities in areas that were earlier considered green zones. Over the past 18 months, the state's town and country planning department approved changes that converted green zones into settlements, allowing construction to take place in these areas which were earlier protected. To know more about this matter, we spoke to Indian Express's Pavneet Singh Chadha, who along with Dheeraj Mishra investigated the story for the paper. Pavneet began by telling us how these changes were made possible. So, what is at the heart of our story is that in Goa's regional plan, there are certain kind of protections accorded to certain green zones. When we say green zones, we mean like paddy fields, agrarian spaces, orchards, eco-sensitive lands, lands where you have no development slopes and natural cover. These are eco-sensitive zones that have been accorded protections so that construction activities don't take place in and around them. And this was done to safeguard Goa's environment because uh, almost 60% of the total area of the state, Goa is a small state, is forest area. So now what has happened over the last few years is that uh, the state has passed certain laws allowing some sort of relaxations through which uh, a lot of these green zones are being converted or the official term for it is corrected to a different zone which then allows construction activity. So there have been concerns by activists that a lot of the areas which were protected are being converted into something called a settlement. So he says that from green zones a lot of land is being converted into settlements, which allows for construction activities to take place for both residential and commercial purposes. And the government has been able to do that by passing a series of amendments and the most our investigation focused around that one amendment which was passed last year in Goa's assembly and it was notified in March last year, which is called the Section 17.2 of the Town and Country Planning Act here. And so, Pavneet, tell us what exactly did this amendment do? How did it allow people to change these areas from green zones to settlements? Right. So, this amendment, Section 17.2, basically allows for conversion of plots without any sort of public consultation if the owner of that plot approaches the department, the Town and Country Planning Department, saying that you have to correct some inadvertent errors or rectify inconsistent or incoherent zoning in the Goa's regional plan, which is in force. What it essentially means is that people, owners of individual plots in Goa, can simply approach the government and say, the erstwhile planners made a mistake. There was an error that was done while zoning this area as a green zone, as a paddy field or as an orchard. And now there has been a lot of development in the area. A lot of contiguous plots are all settlements. The population has increased. So as part of that progressive development, there was a mistake that was committed and my plot was incorrectly zoned. It needs to be corrective. It's an error on the part of the government. And you can simply approach the department under this amendment. And according to certain guidelines that the government has kept, which includes, you know, a site inspection, a scrutiny report. There's a nine member expert committee that looks at individual proposals. And after that, after paying a certain fee, according to the, depending on the area of the plot, the conversion is done. And what exactly was the government's rationale behind bringing this amendment? What did it say about why it was doing this? So the rationale of the government here is that we are giving an opportunity to a lot of poor people, owners of uh, people who have paddy lands in Goa, poor farmers and allow them an opportunity to develop their land. And, you know, and this is also an essential aspect in planning in land use in general across the world that you try to give people an opportunity to develop their lands as the state develops But then what has happened in Goa is that in the garb of these corrections or inadvertent errors, it is essentially opening a door for a lot of people from outside the state to apply for corrections. So that is where this raises concerns from activists that a lot of land is being converted to settlements to allow for the entry of real estate lobbies and a lot of them from outside the states who are coming. So that is essentially at the heart of what the issue is. And so do we know how much land has been converted or corrected in this manner? 
राइट सो अकॉर्डिंग टू डेटा शेयर्ड इन दी असेंबली लास्ट मंथ ओवर ट्वेंटी वन लैक स्क्वेर मीटर्स लैंड विच इज इक्वल टू एन एवरेज लेंथ ऑफ about 330 football fields of green zones has been converted into settlements in goa in the last about 18 months in fact according to the data that was shared in the assembly under this amendment the government received 1075 applications for correction of zones out of which 260 have been approved so that area essentially boils down to about at least 20 lakh square meters and the other major factor here and you mentioned this in your report is that the value of the land changes significantly when it is converted into a settlement so tell our listeners about that a bit and maybe you can give an example in this regard right for instance there have been cases under this amendment that we came across during our investigation that once a land is classified as a settlement like i said both residential and commercial activity can be carried out on it so the owner can then build a house villas hotels residential complexes but paddy land cannot be used for construction activity it can only be used for farming agriculture on orchard land also there are certain guidelines that say that only a farm house of a specified area can be built but when a plot is rezoned to a settlement the value of land appreciates multiple times we came across a plot in anjana it was a 1900 square meter plot in north goa which was previously earmarked in the regional plan as an orchard now this plot was purchased for about 74 lakhs in december 22 3 months before the amendment came in under the amendment it was converted to a settlement and 6 months later the plot was sold for 6.8 crores so its value appreciated many fold and pavneet you mentioned how the government's rationale was that we are bringing about this amendment to give opportunities to the poor but when you access the list of beneficiaries tell us the names that stood out right so like i said when my colleague dheeraj and i we were sort of you know going through this list of all these approvals that have been given under this amendment we found it interesting that uh, as opposed to the rationale of the government a lot of these uh, approvals were in the name of politicians who are in goa including two cabinet ministers some mlas and politicians across party lines and also some influential figures some people in public life and a lot of them were real estate uh, companies basically that applied so we went through mca filings we looked through some public records and we found a sort of trend which sort of established that uh, you know a lot of uh, beneficiaries of this uh, change in land use turned out to be people from outside the goa as well for instance over 60% of the conversions under this amendment uh, belong to only top 20 individuals or companies including many from abroad and about 65 individuals and firms had connections with the real estate housing hospitality hotel or construction sectors and finally the fact that you know there were questions of conflict of interest and political influence on policy because uh, the minister under whose uh, tenure this amendment was passed the town and country planning minister he himself is director of one of the firms which was listed in the approval process the environment minister has one plot which was approved under his name and another in which he is a uh, managing director one firm so all this uh, you know raised questions of conflict of interest and uh, issues of uh, impropriety there's one mla from pernam area pernam has seen a lot of conversions that uh, have taken place under this amendment he has applied and got approval for two of those plots right so you have politicians who are in the cabinet politicians in the ruling bjp government and there is also one politician from the congress party as well and conflict of interest obviously is one major concern here as you said but tell us some of the other things that experts you spoke to have raised about this right so one of the concerns like i mentioned that in the garb of rectifying errors an unprecedented amount of area is being you know released for construction and now what it essentially means is destruction of hill slopes natural cover fields in favor of real estate lobbies and sort of which is fueling a speculative housing market for second homes for the urban elite in fact one of the data points that uh, we recently came across during our research was that goa has about 21% vacant home so a question then arises that all this real estate construction and housing that has been 
created or the area being released for construction who is this being done for when we already have 21% vacant homes in the state for goans the second issue is who decides what is an inadvertent error the activists have raised concerns like there are certain plots that are on top of a hill slope now these are based on topography sheets of survey of india how can this be considered an error in planning or to say that you know the erstwhile planners have made an error so the concern is that the scale of conversions that is happening in a very short time is extremely large like i mentioned at least 20 lakh square meters of land has already been corrected to settlements so that has raised a lot of red flags among activists and urban planners who also contend that this is sort of paving the way for zoning to be becoming a racket for the government and by doing this the government is essentially sacrificing the state's life support systems its natural cover agrarian spaces we recently saw what happened in wayanad so the argument is that you know if we are doing this we are doing away with so much of green spaces in future a similar situation of flooding could arise in goa and pavneet is this something that a lot of local people are concerned about as well are they aware about the extent to which this is happening so land is an issue that has always uh, been at the center of political and legal contests in goa because it always competes with you know concerns about what constitutes development in the name of tourism mining and environmental regulations of forest and coastal zones so people are aware in fact in the past goa has seen a lot of uh, movements around land zoning so there have been governments that have fallen because of these issues in goa so it is a concern that is very much uh, at the heart of uh, you know and minds of the people and as goa proceeds to its next election 2 years from now this is going to be a topic that is going to be very hotly be debated and in the end we talk about rahul gandhi who is currently in the us on his first visit abroad as the leader of the opposition in the lok sabha during this trip which will last until the 16th of september he will meet academics journalists technocrats businessmen and members of the indian diaspora as well as the local community now in line with his previous international trips gandhi has continued to criticize the narendra modi government and has been accusing the bjp of undermining the constitution however this time he has also focused on the party's better than expected performance in the recent lok sabha polls but then the congress party fought an election with the bank accounts frozen and has basically destroyed the idea of modi right so so it has and 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 you can see it because when you see the prime minister now in parliament and i come face to face with him uh he is he is psychologically trapped and he basically cannot come to terms he cannot understand how this has happened right so it for me it's gandhi said, said this during his interaction at the georgetown university in washington and these sentiments were repeated during his address at the university of texas a day earlier where he also said the people in india no longer fear the bjp you see and the other thing that happened the other thing that happened that was very beautiful that in fact i was amazed that it happened so quickly was that fear of the bjp vanished disappeared gone and we saw that immediately within within minutes of the election result nobody in india was scared of the bjp or the prime minister of india so these gandhi are, these also are spoke about his party's campaign strategy and how they came to highlight the constitution during the polls prior to the election we kept stressing on the idea that the institutions have been captured and whenever we'd go india alliance would go we'd go we'd stress on this idea that look the institutions are captured and we don't have a fair playing field uh the education system is captured by the rss the media system is captured the investigative agencies are captured and we keep saying this and people were not quite getting it and we would keep saying it keep saying it again and again and again 
and somehow they were just not getting it. And we couldn't understand why, because we were like, it's obvious to us, it's obvious to them, and something wasn't working. And then in one meeting, uh, one of the people who works with us said, listen, try holding up the constitution. And so I started holding up the constitution. And everything we had said suddenly just exploded. So During his address at the Georgetown University, he also accused the BJP of denying the opposition a fair playing field and said that in a truly fair election, the ruling party would not be able to secure anywhere near 240 seats. They had a financial you know, huge financial advantage. They had locked our bank accounts for one, but huge war chest. Uh, The election commission was doing what they wanted. I mean, the entire campaign was structured so Mr. Modi could, you know, do his thing across the country. States where they were weak were designed differently than states where they they were strong. Um, So I don't don't view it as a free election at all. I view it as a a rather controlled election. He was also asked about caste and Hindutva with references to the Mandal Commission report and the Ram Temple movement, to which he replied that this was a matter of fairness. If we talk about India becoming a modern nation, we have to ask the question about participation of 90% of our population. We can't just ignore it, right? Uh, There's just no way we can ignore it because frankly, if we go down this path, it's not sustainable. Right? So it's not a question of caste or religion or Hindutva or anything else. It's a question of fairness. I, I frankly, as a, as a politician, I don't want to live in a country where 90% of the people do not have access to opportunity. I'm not, I'm not interested. So, so that's my position. Gandhi also and, spoke about Indian secularism, saying that India at its heart is a union of languages traditions, histories, and religions. He was also asked about using the messaging of love in his campaign, at which point he said that he doesn't actually hate PM Modi. I mean, you will be surprised, but I don't, like, I don't actually hate Mr. Modi. Mm -hmm. I, I don't. (laughs) Like, I get up in the morning and okay, you know, he's got a point of view, fine. I don't agree with his point of view, but I don't hate him. And in fact, I, in, in, in many moments, I empathize with him. Right? So it's not that I think that he's my enemy and now I hate him and he's got to be. No, he's got a different point of view. I've got a different point of view. I have uh, empathy and compassion for what he's doing. Uh, and, and I think that's a much better place to be mm-hmm. instead of this thing that, you know, uh, him versus me. I don't think that's productive. You were listening to Three Things by The Indian Express. Today's show was written and produced by me, Shashank Bhargav, and was edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar. If you like the show, then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also recommend the show to someone you think will like it. Share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way for people to get to know about us. You can tweet us at Express Podcasts and write to us at podcast at indianexpress.com.